coming from so many um, different countries. And I must say, it's quite nice to see people who are still interested in French politics, because I must say here in France, we've had uh, so much about the elections that no one wants to discuss um, those elections anymore. So that gives me a chance to talk about the elections. So, so thank you. And thank you all. I know you, it's been a long week for uh, with many lectures. And this is Friday evening. So I, I really appreciate that you are um, here to, to share those few thoughts about French politics and the French elections with me. So I'll just start and share, share my screen, if that's OK with you all. Just let me know if you can see uh, my slides. Is that OK? Right. Um, so the, um, the idea was to give you some um, main takeaways from the French uh, presidential elections. Actually, it won't be only about the uh, presidential elections, but also from the uh, legislative elections, which were just uh, after the, uh, the presidentials. Um, and this will be mostly about the far right. I'm going to talk about um, the other parties and candidates, obviously, but I'm really uh, concentrating this lecture uh, on the far right uh, and far right populism um, in the French context. So um, Erkan just mentioned that what we've seen in, in this election, and which is quite new to French politics, is what I would call the uh, diversification of the far right. Um, until uh, recently, uh, as you probably know, if you uh, if you have been interested in populism in Europe, and especially far right populism, uh, we've had one major far right party in France, which has been the uh, the Front National, the uh, the National Front, um, and it has changed its name more recently into the uh, National Rally, the Rassemblement National. And um, this party has been around for quite some time. It was founded uh, in, the, um, in the early 70s. The first uh, electoral breakthrough uh, occurred in the mid 80s. And with the Front National, uh, you have the uh, typical populist radical right party or far right party uh, in, in Western Europe. Uh, I'm pretty sure you've discussed the work, the, the work of Cass Muda uh, on the populist radical right during the lectures. So usually the French uh, Front National is seen as almost the, the, the typical case of the populist radical right in, France, in, in Europe and, and particularly in France. And um, let's say if we just want to uh, characterize this party, it has had this um, fairly typical niche strategy, you know, um, politicizing mainly immigration and law and order for many years. Um, as you may know, the party took a very strong Eurosceptic turn in the 90s. Um, and since then, it's been promoting uh, this idea of a Europe of independent nations, which basically would mean uh, um, deeply changing the, um, the institutions of the EU. And for many, many years, um, the leader of the party is the um, well-known far-right uh, uh, politician, Jean-Marie Le Pen. You can see the picture here. And uh, about 10 years ago, he was replaced by uh, his own daughter, Marine Le Pen, who has been uh, the leader of the party. And since um, she's taken over the, the party, she's been quite successful because overall, um, the party has won an average 20 to 25 percent of the vote in national elections. So it's been quite a, an important party. And the far right has become a, a, a fixture of the French party system. It's, it has become a uh, institutionalized competing in all elections. So it's quite now an important player in French politics. And this year in the 2022 20, uh, presidential election, Marine Le Pen was uh, the, the far right candidate for the first time, for the third time, sorry. Uh, she, uh, she actually uh, ran in 2012, 2017, and 2020. But this year, we've had a, a new far right politician, um, and uh, Eric Khan uh, mentioned his name. Um, uh, his name is Eric Zemmour, who's actually a former journalist and, and media pundit uh, coming from the conservative right. He's been, um, you know, mostly working for a, a French newspaper called Le Figaro, which is a conservative right-wing paper. It's not a far-right paper. But over the years, um, uh, Zemmour has moved to the far-right and is, um, is moved closer to, um, you know, the, um, 
the identitarian movement in France, which is the uh, a, a very um, strong uh, strand of the French far right, of the European far right. And it's also created links with um, far right groups uh, in France. And ideologically, and we're going to discuss that in a minute, um, it's come close to um, a, a, the broad sector of the French uh, reactionary far right, which is comparable to the American alt-right, if you want to uh, understand what this is about. And uh, especially, it's been very close uh, to Marion Maréchal, who's another leading figure of the far right in France, and is actually the niece of Marine Le Pen and the, uh, the, the granddaughter of Jean-Marie Le Pen. So it's a family business. And uh, Marion Maréchal uh, really uh, incarnates this uh, right-wing, conservative, reactionary um, strand of the far right. So Zemmour got into the campaign quite early, um, he managed to set up a new party, which is called uh, Reconquête in French, uh, in English that would translate into uh, Reconquest. And uh, it's claimed about 100,000 members, but these are uh, you know, essentially internet and instant members. So it's not like a, a, an established party, but rather an, a, 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 an internet party, but still it's quite a successful um, undertaking. And uh, in January, Zemmour was still putting about 14% of voting intentions, which means that he was quite successful in uh, you know, taking or attracting a number of far-right and right-wing conservative voters. So he was set to win quite a substantial share of the vote, but as we're going to see in a minute, things uh, turn out uh, differently. Um, if I look at... Uh, those two main candidates, Marine Le Pen on the one hand and Eric Zemmour on the other hand, they do share the, the common ideological features of far-right populism. And I'm pretty sure you've discussed this uh, quite extensively uh, in all the lectures you've had, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the, the definitions uh, for the concepts unless you want me to. But clearly what we see in uh, Le Pen and Zemmour is a typical set of um, populist radical right ideological features. And these features, they are well known and you find them in both candidates, Le Pen and Zemmour. Uh, first, you see that both candidates, they have a nationalist or a nativist agenda. So you find this idea of uh, immigration as a threat um, and as a, both a cultural economic threat. Uh, we find in both candidates this idea of, well, the, the typical welfare chauvinist um, uh, dimension, which is, you know, translated uh, into this um, principle of national priority or national preference in jobs and welfare for, for the French over immigrants. Um, the two candidates, they also share an uh, authoritarian view of society, especially with very strong law and order policies. And of course, they have in common populism. And that's something that hasn't been mentioned very often, um, even here in France, talking about Zemmour and Le Pen, but they both have or show the typical uh, characteristics of populism. And I'm not going to get into those characteristics. We can discuss that further if you want in, in the uh, Q&A. And finally, what was very interesting is that we found in Zemmour the sort of Euroscepticism that was typical of the Front National, or that has been typical of the Front National since the, uh, the, the mid 90s. So if I take those two candidates, they were very similar when it comes to their core ideology, their core populist radical right ideology. So if we want to see why um, the, the differences and why in the end um, different electoral outcomes we have to look at their um, electoral strategies. And this is where we see uh, more differences. Um, if I start with Le Pen, and I just want to give you some uh, um, broad ideas of what was the main electoral strategy of Le Pen in this election, let's say it's a combination of two things. Um, the first one is de-demonization. I'm gonna explain that in a second. And the other is uh, what I refer to as social populism. Um, the first thing is that when Marine Le Pen took over the party uh, over 10 years ago now, she started what she called um, de-demonization, um, which essentially is this idea that 
um, she's been trying to um, detoxify um, the uh, far right reputation of the party. She wants the um, party now, the Rassemblement National, the, the National Rally, to be um, like any other party. She claims that it's no longer a far right party. And in this campaign, it was very interesting because Marine Le Pen not only continued this uh, de detoxification or de de demonization strategy, but also she um, adopted a very low profile campaign, um, you know, very small scale meetings. Um, she would present herself as the typical working mother. As she, actually, she's a single mother of three. So she would, uh, you know, put that forward saying, well, I'm like you people, you know, I'm a, I'm a hardworking and struggling uh, uh, single mother with three kids. And she even uh, portrayed herself as a cat breeder. It just happened and that she got her, uh, her degree in cat breeding uh, during <laughs> the first lockdown. That, so that was part of the... Uh, the whole strategy. And of course, this was part of the strategy of presenting herself as a more respectable politician. You know, someone who is no longer a far right uh, candidate or far right politician, just to reassure people and make more voters uh, vote for, for a party. And the other thing which I think was quite significant in this election is that uh, five years ago, uh, Marine Le Pen came into the election with very controversial po policies, especially with regard to the EU. Some of you may recall that she was very much in favor of leaving the EU or leaving the Eurozone at the time. This year, she's been very careful to uh, hide those uh, very controversial policies. And that's how I, that's why I refer to this as a stealth mode in the sense that uh, the policies haven't changed but Marine Le Pen took very good care not to uh, uh, make those uh, policies too prominent, too visible in the campaign. So that's the first thing, changing the image of, of, of herself and of her party. So this old de-demonization strategy. And meanwhile, uh, Marine Le Pen has done something else uh, since she took over the, uh, the party. Um, she, she's tried and expanded the, um, the, the agenda or the, uh, the policy agenda of our party to include more uh, socioeconomic issues. You may have discussed the fact that more, uh, most uh, populist radical right parties in Europe, they have a niche strategy. They um, essentially deal with uh, immigration uh, and law and order, cultural issues. They sort of ignore socioeconomic issues. And Marine Le Pen has sort of rebalanced the party manifesto and the party program to give more salience to those uh, socioeconomic issues. And most importantly, she has taken a party very much to the economic left, which is something quite unusual for the, the populist radical right, because if, if we follow the, uh, the classic literature, uh, the, the populist radical right is usually more market liberal on the economy, but Marine Le Pen has taken a clear shift to the left. You know, um, um, she wants to increase wages, pensions. She wants uh, more social protection, more public services. She's been, you know, uh, uh, pledging more health services. So she's really um, put a lot of um, uh, emphasis or a great of, um, you know, uh, emphasis on those socioeconomic issues. And in this election, she has done something very specific. She has um, really emphasized one issue, which is the cost of living. And uh, the thing is that in this election, and because of rising prices and inflation in France, like elsewhere in Europe, the cost of living has become, or was, because it was a, a few months ago now, but it's still the case, um, the cost of living was the number one issue for quite a, a majority of voters. So in that sense, Marine Le Pen has aligned herself or a party with the most salient issue for French voters at the time of the election, which was uh, and still is the cost of living. So that's the, um, these are the two main, uh, I would say the two main uh, traits or uh, dimensions of the electoral strategy of Le Pen in this election. You know, playing with uh, the de-demonization de card on the one end and turning to social populism on the other end. 
Now, if we compare that with Eric Zemmour, um, we see quite um, a number of substantial uh, differences. The first is that um, Eric Zemmour in this election has taken a very strong uh, ethno-nationalist and uh, anti-Islam uh, agenda. And he's been promoting or endorsing conspiracy theories such as the Great Replacement, which I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, and which uh, in France, like elsewhere in Europe, are clearly typical of the far right and the, uh, the most extreme wing of, of the far right. And he's even, um, you know, uh, adopted themes such as remigration, which is this idea of sending a large number of immigrants back to their country of origin, which is really one um, theme that, that comes from the far right and is still very much associated with the, the far right. So let's say that Zemmour, unlike Le Pen, has really played the far right card in this election. He's really placed himself um, to the far right of French politics. And doing that, he's made a number of cont controversial and even um, aggressive and offensive comments during the election. He's taken you know, xenophobic stances, uh, again, quite strong anti-Islam stances, even playing the, the sexist card at time and uh, you know, uh, castigating LGBT groups. And so uh, he's had um, quite, a, uh, quite a very um, radical uh, stance in this campaign. He uh, even gave the middle finger to someone in front of a camera during the campaign. So let's say, um, unlike Le Pen, who really played the, the card of moderation, uh, Zemmour really took the campaign, his campaign, to the, to the far right. And again, unlike Le Pen, we've just said that Le Pen tried to find the proper balance between uh, economic and cultural issues. Uh, Zemmour really stayed focused uh, on uh, cultural issues and, and mostly immigration and national identity. The whole campaign was about immigration, Islam, national identity. It was very hard for Zemmour to uh, to move outside this uh, niche uh, uh, strategy or to, to uh, expand and to address other concerns. Um, and two other things uh, which I think are, are important to understand um, the, um, the trajectory of Eric Zemmour in this campaign. The first one is that, again, unlike Le Pen, Eric Zemmour took a very strong uh, reactionary uh, stance you know, he's been playing with this sort of anti-workism and cancel culture um, uh, discourse, which is not the case that much for Marine Le Pen. And actually, um, someone, I think, in the uh, self-presentation mentioned the links with the, um, the, the conservative movements or the uh, re reactionary movements in France. And actually, yes, if you see the uh, Mouvement Conservateur, which is the, the main reactionary um, uh, strand of the French right, this, uh, this movement has joined the Zemmour campaign. So there is very strong link between Zemmour and the, uh, the French alt-right or reactionary right. And finally, um, for Zemmour, again, unlike Marine Le Pen, clearly shifted to the, to the, to the left on the economy, Zemmour uh, kept with a more traditional pro-market economic agenda. Um, you know, lowering taxes uh, for businesses and uh, cutting down welfare. So uh, we'll see in a minute that this didn't quite align with um, voter demands for more social protection, for more health care and, um, and more public services. So these are the, the strategies. Uh, very briefly about the context uh, of those elections before we, we turn to the outcome. I'm, I'm checking the time to make sure I don't uh, take too much time uh, for this lecture. Um, well, clearly, like in the rest of Europe, this election took place, you know, um, in the uh, sort of post COVID 19 pandemic, although we, we're now hit by the, uh, the a new wave of COVID, like many countries. But at the time, um, we, we had a recess in the number of COVID cases, but still, the um, healthcare system was. Under a lot, is still uh, under a, quite a lot of strain. And also, we've had in France, like in Germany, Austria, and other countries, a very strong protest against vaccination or, um, you know, um, uh, 
health passes or green passes. So this has been part of the, uh, of the electoral agenda. At the same time, we've had a very low un unemployment. Uh, actually, in this election, uh, unemployment was down to 7.3%, which is uh, above its pre-2008 crisis level. So this is one of the lowest um, uh, level of unemployment in France for the past 15 years. Um, but as I said, um, we've been uh, dealing with rising prices and, and the uh, issue of cost of living. And in this election, um, what uh, we refer to uh, as a purchasing power, so the cost of living um, in France, was the number one issue for voters. And 58% of French voters in the election said that their purchasing power, so their, their pocketbook issue or pocketbook money, was the, uh, the number one issue for them at the time of vote. And the two other um, contextual elements, which I think are worth noting here, um, are of course the um, the wave of uh, political unrest and uh, discontent with uh, Emmanuel Macron, the uh, incumbent president. And some of you may recall the uh, Yellow Jacket movement a couple of years ago, which was really sort of uh, epitomizing the, uh, the depth of uh, political discontent with Macron, with uh, his uh, style of presidency, with his personality, and with uh, his um, the way uh, he was uh, exercising power. And of course, um, from uh, early March on, we, um, like the rest of Europe, were uh, confronting uh, the, the war in Ukraine, which became, of course, uh, an important issue uh, in this election. Um, so now turning to the election, um, and just to give you an idea of um, those issues that really mattered uh, for French voters, as you can see from the chart, and uh, not surprisingly, we find the, the three main issues I just um, mentioned, cost of living, number one issue for most French voters, healthcare, um, which is quite uh, important and what's quite important in the uh, sort of post pandemic um, period of, of the election. And then the Ukraine war, which came third um, together with the uh, environment. So uh, now, very briefly, the, um, the main parties and candidates, I don't want to spend too much time uh, there, but the, the, uh, the, the four main candidates were um, Emmanuel Macron, that's the guy, I don't know if you can see the picture top right, but that's the um, nice looking guy uh, top right of the picture. And he's the, actually a, a center right liberal uh, candidate and he's the, um, the incumbent president. So we've had our two far right candidates, Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour. And the fourth and main competitor was Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who's the leader of the, uh, the radical left in France. Um, and so these were the, the, the main uh, candidates. We've had uh, other candidates in this election, but they were uh, less relevant and most of them didn't uh, quite um, didn't do very well in this election. And most of them were under the 5% the threshold. So we just concentrate on those four uh, main candidates, Macron for the, the center right, Le Pen and Zemmour for the far right, and Mélenchon for um, the, uh, the radical left. So if we look at the outcome of the election, uh, you can see that, uh, again, um, it was Macron and Le Pen uh, who won the election. Actually, Macron came first and, and Le Pen came second. Um, so if we look at very briefly, the, the structure of the um, of French politics in this presidential election. But we've seen something which is quite new uh, 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 to French politics, which is this um, three block structure with a very strong center, and that's Emmanuel Macron, about 28% of the vote, and two very strong um, radical uh, wings to the left and right, we have uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon to the left with about 20% of the vote. And then the, um, the combination of Zemmour and, uh, and, and Le Pen to the far right. And as you can see, that's, that makes nearly a third of the, uh, of the vote in the first round. And at the same time, we've seen uh, the, the collapse of traditional parties, um, traditional mainstream parties of the right and left. So, Clearly, what we've seen in this election, and this was confirmed in the um, legislative elections, is uh, increased polarization in French politics with one center and then 
two very strong radical, uh, radical uh, alternatives, both left and right. And uh, in this election, although that's not the topic of, of this lecture, there was a very strong um, or very significant rise in support for the radical left. I mean, Mélenchon did very well in this election and he's managed to uh, you know, bring together quite a um, large number of, uh, of left-wing voters. But now we, we want to, to concentrate uh, on the far right. So the question is, um, uh, why did uh, Zemmour fail? I'm sorry, I, I just realized I, I forgot to mention that Zemmour only won 7% of the vote, which means that uh, in January, he was given about 14 to 15% in voting intentions. But by the time of the election, early um, April, he only got 7% um, uh, in the end. And I think there are four reasons why uh, Zemmour failed. Um, the first one is um, the one we've just mentioned a few minutes ago, is that I think his uh, cultural niche strategy was too narrow. Uh, in this election, voters wanted to, um, to address some very, very uh, deep economic anxieties and, and concerns with the cost of living, with health care, with public services. And uh, I think, and Zemmour stayed with these um, identity issues or immigration issues, and he failed uh, somehow to address those uh, socioeconomic uh, anxieties that were very strong and very deep in, in the French public. Um, the second reason is uh, the far right discourse, themes, and these uh, very aggressive comments. Uh, we see in a minute that for many voters, uh, Zemmour was really seen as, uh, as far right, as somebody who is a, very, uh, who is a threat to the French Republic, a threat to democracy. So in that sense, um, the, is a very, um, is a strategy of taking his campaign very much the far right, sort of scared voters. And many of the voters in the end turned to other candidates because they were very worried about him. But then the two main issues uh, were political and they were um, also policy related. The first one is the uh, pro-market agenda. Uh, most French voters in this election, they wanted um, more social protection, more health care, more welfare. They wanted, you know, uh, uh, prices control. And they wanted um, that wages and pensions be uh, increased. So in that sense, I would say that the, the pro-market agenda of Zemmour didn't quite align with voter demand for redistribution and social protection. He was uh, somehow at odds with, with, the, with voters, with the, the bulk of voters who really wanted more social protection. But clearly the, the main issue um, was uh, Zemmour's proximity with Putin and Russia. And during the campaign, and just after the war in Russia started, Zemmour was very ambivalent, very uh, unclear about his relationship with Putin and, and Russia. And unlike Le Pen, who was more critical uh, of Putin, although she was really uh, uh, an admirer of Putin in the past, but in the election and just after the war started, she understood that she had to change her discourse on Russia because most French voters would then see Putin as a threat. Uh, but um, Zemmour failed to do that. And if you look at the, the voting intentions um, in the chart, you can clearly see that for uh, many weeks, um, Zemmour was not very far from Le Pen. He was still behind her on average, but he wasn't very far. And he was still around, um, let's say, 10 or 12 to 15% in voting intentions. But then, after the war um, in, in Ukraine started, you can see this very significant drop in support for Zemmour. And clearly the main reason is, I think, uh, Zemmour's support for, uh, for Putin and, and the war in Russia, in, uh, sorry, in Ukraine. And this, I think, is the main, was the main issue and the main um, reason why uh, Zemmour failed and started to lose support um, in, in the course and why he um, ended up winning only 7%. Uh, um, and just to uh, illustrate this, and I'm sorry, I didn't have time to translate this, uh, this table, but this is a poll that we conducted at Sciences Po to look at uh, the main traits of the candidates as perceived by voters. 
And you can tell that um, here, I'm going to take the pencil. Um, if you think, if you look at Zemur, the, the main feature of Zemur, the main trait was that he was uh, worrying people. People were scared of him. They thought uh, he is a danger, he is a threat for democracy. And you can tell the difference with Le Pen, uh, who was seen as, a, as somebody worrying uh, only by half of the people, whereas it was about two thirds of, um, of the people for, uh, for Eric Zemmour. And the other main difference you can find here, um, somehow Le Pen was seen um, as uh, having what it takes to be, uh, to be president. 39% uh, of the people of French voters would see Le Pen as fit for the job, uh, so to speak. And it was only 21% here for Zemmour. And maybe one last set of, uh, of um, figures from this table. Um, one very important thing that Le Pen was the candidate that was seen as the one who uh, best understands uh, the common people, people like us. And it was only 27% uh, for the incoming president and 29% for, for Eric Zemmour. So Le Pen, uh, in that table, you have the illustration of those um, you know, diverging strategies and the, the outcomes they produced amongst French voters that Le Pen was seen as fit for the job, uh, less extreme or less worrying than Zemmour. And she was also uh, seen uh, as uh, closer and more, uh, um, with more empathy towards the, the common people and the, uh, the, uh, the everyday uh, citizens. So that's why uh, I think we, this table is in interesting to illustrate the, the differences between the, um, the, two, uh, the two candidates. And if I just look at the um, issues um, that were most important, this time we're not looking at all voters, but I just try to look at uh, the, uh, the different electorates and I've just taken the four main candidates and we're just gonna concentrate on the two we are, uh, we are interested in. You can tell that um, the issue that mattered most for people who voted for Zemmour, not surprisingly were immigration and crime the first two, and then cost of living. And again, remember that cost of living was the number one issue for all voters. So it's not surprising that you, you do find some uh, element of that even amongst the, uh, the Zemmour uh, voters. But you can see with Zemmour, we have the typical far right um, issues, you know, immigration, law and order or crime. Now, if we turn to Le Pen, it's interesting because you can tell the difference here with Le Pen, um, we, uh, we have uh, cost of living, sorry, I'm trying to get the pencil right here. For about two thirds of them, that was the number one issue for a pen voters. So we have a socioeconomic issue and we have pensions coming third. And you can see that unlike Zemmour, immigration, of course, is still part of the, um, the issues that matter to Le Pen voters because they are still far right voters. But this gives you an idea of how Le Pen has managed to expand the electoral basis and address uh, socioeconomic concerns. And that's something quite interesting in the context of the populist radical right, because again, in the literature, we are being told uh, that uh, those parties, they mostly uh, politicize cultural issues. So in that sense, you can see that the, the uh, populist radical right in France may be successful when they manage to address uh, socioeconomic concerns. And in this election, this has become very clear, uh, especially with this sort of a, uh, relevance uh, of cost of living. And you can see here from uh, Zemmour about more than three quarters of his voters were still um, focusing on immigration. So a cultural issue. So that, that would be a more typical populist radical right sort of, uh, of profile in, in a sense. Um, and we find something uh, interesting, uh, which I wanted to mention as well. It, it's more, uh, it's not as important, but um, another very, um, uh, another significant um, uh, factor behind the, um, the, uh, the uh, rise in support for Le Pen or Le Pen's success over Zemmour was partly uh, strategic voting. 
You know that in French presidential, only the, the first two candidates can progress into the runoff. So you have to come first or second if you want to get a chance to go to the uh, decisive round. And in that sense, voters, they might sometimes choose to uh, vote for a candidate, which is not their preferred candidate, but the candidate that has the best chances to move to the runoff. And uh, this is what we call in French the vote utile, the useful vote. In English, it's more often uh, referred to as strategic voting. And um, from the, the survey we've conducted, you can see that um, people who voted for Zemmour, they mostly wanted to uh, vote for their preferred candidate. You know, only 9% of them voted uh, for, uh, for Zemmour um, just to give him the chance to, to go to the second, uh, second round runoff. If we compare that with Le Pen, it's 20%. So it's quite a significant difference, which means that in the course of the campaign, We've seen also Le Pen um, becoming the, the strategic vote on the far right. Uh, people wanted the far right candidate or the far, far right ideas and policies to be represented in the runoff. Run they sort of moved away from Zemmour because they could see that Zemmour had less chances to move to the, uh, to the uh, second round runoff and they moved to Le Pen. So in that sense, part of Le Pen's success can be explained by this um, strategic voting or this useful vote if we, uh, if we use the French, uh, the French term. So I think it's quite, in, quite important. And um, if we look at the sociology, and this brings us back to, uh, to what we discussed before, um, we, we can see that, uh, again, there were very different constituencies looking at Le Pen and Zemmour, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because uh, I can see time is running, but um, Le Pen is clearly uh, drawing most of her support from uh, working class people with uh, low education, uh, low income, and there are mostly people uh, living in rural or uh, small urban areas, not in the large cities. Um, these are people who um, feel socially deprived when we ask them, whether they, um, they, uh, they feel that they, uh, they are comfortable on their, on their income. Most of the people who vote for Le Pen, actually they, they say it's hard for them to, uh, to meet ends. Um, in terms of age, they are not older voters. They are mostly people within the uh, 25 to 50 uh, years uh, old uh, age bands. So they are mostly uh, those economically active and um, a very strong feature uh, of the, this electorate was uh, anti-EU. Um, we can see in our survey that uh, alongside you know, immigration issues, which are still very important or law and order, people who vote for Le Pen, they continue to be uh, very much uh, against the EU. Uh, so that's quite, quite a strong feature. Now, if we look at uh, Zemmour voters, uh, although it's a, it's a smaller constituency, remember that we, we're talking about seven percent of the of the of the first round vote, but still we can see some differences, and they tend to be more male, and this has probably uh, to do with the uh, the sexist um, ideology or discourse of Zemmour in the election. They tend to be older voters, and they tend to be more uh, uh, affluent, and they are more. Uh, slightly more educated, they have more income, they're higher income than, than Le Pen voters. And um, what is interesting is that they are mostly found in the southern regions. And I'm, I don't have time to explain that, but there is a some sort of a historical uh, tropism of the south in France, where the far right has always been more conservative and older and more bourgeois than in other parts of the country. And I can discuss that later if you want. And uh, like Le Pen, we see in Zemmour very strong anti-EU feelings or attitude, and of course, very strong anti-immigration attitude. And uh, we have a uh, whole range of indicators in, about Islam, immigration, national identity, and Zemmour uh, voters, they score high on every single of those variables. So they, they're truly uh, characterized by the, uh, I, was, I was about to say, by their obsession with immigration and national identity, and uh, in particular, uh, Islam. And finally, um, to um, uh, discuss the, uh, the, the outcome of the presidential election, 
so Marine Le Pen progressed to the to the, um, to the second round runoff once again uh, this year against Emmanuel Macron. So that sort of uh, reiterated the uh, the uh, 2017 uh, uh, second round. And what was very interesting um, is that. Uh, Marine Le Pen did very well. She won uh, nearly 42% of the vote, which is quite substantial. Five years ago, she had won uh, only 33%, so it's quite a substantial increase. And I would say one of the main variables to understand this, uh, this uh, shift or this uh, you know, increase in support for Le Pen in, this, uh, in, the, uh, in the runoff is uh, what I would call negative voting. And you can see from the chart, we, we've done the survey uh, in, back in 2017, and then again in 2022. And we've asked people, did you vote for the candidate or mostly other, uh, against the other candidate to block the other candidate from winning the presidency? And back in 2017, you can see that uh, most people who voted for Macron, uh, I mean, a lot of people who voted for Macron, actually 43% of them, they wanted to block Le Pen from uh, winning the presidency. And that's something we've seen in France. Most people, even if they don't agree with the candidate, will vote for a candidate to uh, block the far right from winning uh, the election. And, um, and then those who voted Le Pen, only 22% of them, they wanted to block Macron. So uh, it was in a way... Uh, uh, different uh, a different scale. Now, if we turn to the um, um, the 2022 election on the right hand side of the of the chart, you can see that almost the same proportion of Le Pen and Macron voters, about 45 percent of them, actually voted to block the other candidate. So they they didn't really vote for the uh, the candidate either Macron or Le Pen, but they really voted to stop the other from winning. And this uh, negative voting, I think, is quite interesting because it illustrates those two fronts uh, in the runoff. The first one is the uh, traditional uh, anti-far-right front. It's called the uh, Republican Front in, in France, where all parties get together to stop the far-right. But this year, because of the uh, of deep political discontent with Macron, we had another front playing against the Republican Front, which is the anti-Macron Front. And you can see that the uh, presidential run of this year was very much structured by those two fronts um, playing one against the other. And that's why we've, uh, we've seen uh, Le Pen making such, um, such a, a successful uh, second round score and with uh, nearly 42% of the vote. Um, now, very briefly, um, I think I got uh, about 10 to 15 minutes left, but I just want to say a couple of words about uh, the uh, legislative elections, um, because this was um, just after the uh, presidential election, and uh, in this election, we've uh, elected our uh, uh, MPs for the National Assembly for the next five years, that these are the people who are going to uh, support Emmanuel Macron in Parliament. And this year, um, the far right did very well. Actually, the Rassemblement National did very well. They won 18.7% um, of the first round vote, which is uh, less than what they did in the presidential, which, which is the, uh, uh, the, the best score ever uh, by the, uh, the far right in um, legislative elections in France. So this is really a, a all times high in support for the, for the far right in that type of election. And most importantly, the, um, uh, the, the party won 89 seats in National Assembly. Um, so maybe uh, just to give you an idea, there are about 600, a uh, little less than 600 seats in French National Assembly. So 89 is quite a lot. And uh, this compares with eight seats back in 2017. So uh, this year, the French far right has multiplied by more than 10 the number of seats that they have in the National Assembly. So now they've, uh, they've been able to form their own group. That's a nice photograph you can see uh, on, on the right of the slide. These are the, the new uh, uh, Rassemblement National MPs. And you can see with the, uh, the purple jacket in the middle, that's Marine Le Pen, who's now the, the leader of the, uh, the parliamentary party. And meanwhile, and I think uh, Erkan mentioned that, 
Zemmour uh, failed to win any seat in the um, legislative election. He was truly um, politically marginalized in this election, and uh, none of the uh, recon reconquest candidates managed to, uh, to win a seat or even to uh, move to the second round. So they were completely uh, washed, washed out of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the election. And again, if we want to understand why such a success of the far right in the uh, legislative election, I would say that the, the, the first thing was, uh, again, very high abstention and, and protest. We had, uh, I can't remember the exact figure, but more than 50% abstention, which means that one in two of French voters didn't turn out in, in, the, in the election, which is quite, quite high. And again, what we've seen um, is quite uh, similar to the, uh, what I just described for the uh, presidential election, is a very strong negative voting against uh, Macron and his party, which is now called Ensemble together in, in English. And we've seen that many voters, they've actually uh, voted against Macron. They wanted to uh, deprive Macron of the absolute majority in the National Assembly, just to force him into uh, comp compromises and uh, negotiations with the other parties. And lastly, um, I think what we've seen, which is quite uh, important in the history of the far right in France, I mentioned the uh, Republican Front. And for many years, the Republican Front has been the uh, main uh, mechanism through which uh, parties and voters have blocked the far right. They've stopped the far right uh, or prevent the far right from winning seats uh, in legislative elections or winning regions or winning the presidency. And in this election, um, and, and again, that's the result of uh, a protest against Macron and probably uh, of uh, de-demonization, um, we've seen a, a very strong waning of the Republican Front. Uh, French voters have been much less keen on voting against the far right. Uh, it's almost like this year, they wanted to, um, let's say, to give the far right a chance to actually uh, have their own uh, parliamentary group in National Assembly and have a proper representation. So in that sense, the, um, the as National Assembly this year uh, is a lot more proportional than it used to be uh, in the past years. And uh, so we, we have a, a quite an unprecedented um, situation with quite a large number of, of far-right MPs, which we've never had before. So this is uh, quite, quite new, and this is clearly a new phase in the history of the far-right in France. Um, maybe just to conclude, uh, one uh, last slide about um, the, uh, or maybe two last slides about, first, the main takeaways from this lecture, um, and maybe a, a couple of uh, thoughts about the future of the far-right in France. Um, I would say, to understand what happens, what happened in this election in France, um, I would probably say that uh, Marine Le Pen uh, checked three very important boxes in this election. The first one is that she managed to uh, combine the traditional agenda of the far right, that is immigration and national identity, with uh, socioeconomic issues. And in that sense, uh, she's achieved a, a strategy which is quite unusual for the, the populist radical right, which is to combine a um, right-wing conservative, conservative agenda on cultural issues with a left-wing uh, agenda on the economy. And that combination is, uh, I would say, quite peculiar. You, you find you may find it in other parties, but this is really something that has become very typical of the, of the French far right, and which I think explains partly the success of the party in this election. Second box that uh, Le Pen checked in this election, I think she has managed to present a more credible and more respectable profile for her party and for herself. And as I said, um, she, she has gone into stealth mode on the most controversial policies. And I think she's been quite successful in doing this. I mean, I've spoken with many journalists here in France and they, uh, they all told me, oh, so Le Pen, she's no longer against the EU. And I had to tell them, no, she's still against the EU. She just 
completely hides this and she doesn't talk about this, but she, yes, trust me, she's still against the EU. So I think for many voters, um, she managed to have this more credible and more respectable profile. And maybe the third and very important box that she checked in this election is that she uh, understood very early in the campaign that the cost of living was about to be the uh, number one issue for the French. And she actually started campaigning on this issue long before uh, the uh, presidential campaign started, long before the war in Ukraine. Um, I mean, as soon as she saw inflation was on the rise, the rise in the uh, sort of post-pandemic time, um, she started to politicize the, uh, the cost of living. So she was very extremely successful in this. And I, I think she's, uh, she's finding the, the right way to address the, um, this issue uh, for French voters. Now, if we turn to Zemmour again, uh, what we've just discussed, just uh, summarizing this, um, she clearly, he clearly went too far during the campaign, too far right. Um, I would say he's, he's, he was stuck with his uh, niche strategy on immigration and national identity, and this was definitely too narrow to address the, the, the wide range of concerns in the French public and mostly uh, socioeconomic anxieties. Again, I would say the, the pro-market agenda of Zemmour was uh, less aligned with what the preferences for social protection. And most importantly, um, I think Zemmour lost a lot of support over his um, sympathy uh, for, uh, for Vladimir Putin and Russia. And clearly, uh, as we've seen in voting intentions after the war in Ukraine started, Zemmour started to lose support because he was, as I said, very ambivalent with Russia and Putin and the uh, invasion of Ukraine. So my last slide about the future of far-right populism in France. Um, well, I would say now, the uh, Marine Le Pen and the Rassemblement National, the, uh, the, the national rally, are even more firmly established as the dominant force of the far-right, on the far-right. They are clearly are the leading party uh, and there's um, I think no, uh, no doubt about this. Um, let's mention that uh, because of the success in the election, and especially the success in the uh, legislative elections, uh, the, the far right will receive a lot more public funding. You know, in France, uh, political parties are funded by the state and they receive funding uh, proportionate to their uh, electoral outcomes and the number of MPs they get elected. So this year, um, the, the, um, the outcome of the election will give Marine Le Pen and her party about 10 million euros each year of public funding. So it's, it's quite substantial. So that will help develop the party and, and sustain it over the years. So this is quite an important uh, aspect. At the same time, um, I think we've um, witnessed the uh, political marginalization of Eric Zemmour. And um, my... Uh, anticipation is that Zemmour will, um, it will be very hard for Zemmour to come back into French politics after this election and the, uh, the uh, successive failures. And in that sense, some of you may remember um, the um, uh, Bruno Maigret who was a, uh, a member of the Front National back in the uh, early 2000s. He left the party at the time, tried to set up his own party against Jean-Marie Le Pen and he failed and he uh, almost disappeared from, uh, from French politics. So I would say that Zemmour is probably uh, on the same trajectory. Um, I would say it is very likely that he will become marginalized and, and probably will leave French politics in the near future. Now, for Le Pen and the Rassemblement National, we clearly uh, uh, have a new phase of uh, normalization or institutionalization. Uh, again, because of the strength of the party in national parliament, which is new and uh, has never happened before. So I would say to, as a conclusion that Le Pen will have to solve um, three, um, three strategic equations. The first one is that um, she's been playing the uh, credibility card in this election. And obviously um, this has been quite successful. 
But we know that in the, in the far right, there is a persistent tension between uh, radicalness and credibility. And um, if the, the far right becomes too credible, too respectable, if it becomes like uh, any other party, it risks losing support for radical voters. So for Marine Le Pen, in the future, I think she will have to find the proper balance between being radical and being credible. And um, I often quote Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, who said many years ago, uh, no, nobody is interested in a nice far right or a nice Front National. It has to be mean, meaning that it has to be radical. If it's, if it's not radical enough, then they lose votes. So we'll see in the future, in the, in the next month and weeks, whether uh, Le Pen manages to uh, find the proper balance between those two, uh, those two um, objectives of uh, being radical and being credible. The second thing, uh, which I think is quite important for, for Le Pen and her party, is her ability to surmount the uh, sociological hurdle. Because in this election, we've seen that Le Pen is still um, uh, you know, uh, in trouble with uh, older voters, with urban voters, and those with uh, higher level of education, and broadly speaking, upper class voters. So these are groups that still um, are very, very much less likely to vote for the Rassemblement National, but they are very important, especially older voters. So for Marine Le Pen, there is something about our policies in the future that will need to be uh, addressed or changed if she wants to speak to those voters, because right now she's still very much uh, in deficit when it comes to older and more educated voters. And lastly, um, I would say that at the moment, if you look at the, uh, the French political landscape, Marine Le Pen and the, the far right they're sort of uh, occupy the main space of the conservative right, because the conservative right has uh, you know, been really weakened in this election. They are really in tatter. And what is very interesting is that at the moment, um, Marine Le Pen has very strong incentives to occupy the, that space and transform a party into a, the new main conservative party uh, of the right. And at the same time, to do that, she will have to change our policies on the economy. Recall that we've uh, discussed, she's taken our party very much to the left on the economy. And more importantly, she will have to change our, um, our policies on Europe because right now she's still Eurosceptic and that doesn't uh, fit very well with uh, those, uh, those conservative right-wing voters. So I would say if um, Le Pen, manages um, to, um, to solve those three equations, you know, radicalness versus credibility, the sociology of our constituency, and uh, truly get uh, or take over the conservative right, then I would say, unfortunately, she has very good chances to win the next presidential election in five years' time. That would be my conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, for this very nice, rich presentation. So we get many, many things, especially to understand correctly what's happening actually in this diversification of the far right in, in France, how Le Pen changed the image, image of the party, how she develops a kind of strategy, a kind of strategy to not only to, to attract the far right voters, but at the same time to become normalized, but to become a, a, a kind of mainstream party in, in the French context. And also the Zem, which is another figure, which is another important figure now, which uh, plays with the far right cards, like tapping into the migration, xenophobic, anti-EU, anti-Islam stances that we uh, see during these, the, these last uh, couple of the, the, the month. Uh, and also we saw also the sociodemography of the waters and how this sociodemography plays um, a role in the elections, not only to understand Le Pen, but it's at the same time for Macron and also the Melanchons who vote and how they develop the, some of the strategies. Uh, for example, for the to attract people from the small urban areas or urban uh, areas or the working classes, whatever. So these are the, some of the voting strategies that gives us so to understand correctly how Le Pen, the daughter of the Le Pen, the father Le Pen, how he, he, she changed actually the party from the from the from the very 
little uh, anti-migrant, anti-EU, anti-establishment party to do a kind of normalized party.